Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a privilege to have you today participating in one of the, I'm a little biased here, in one of the really, really important sessions or workshops in our annual research forum. Um, as you all know, you probably have heard some of, of those of you who have attended the sessions earlier today, you may have already gotten an idea about Qatar National Research Strategy. What are the pillars of our national research strategy? And how much really the biomedical research is a central piece in that national research strategy? And we are fortunate today to have some of really the global science leaders, uh, whether in basic sciences, in applied sciences, clinical applications, um, on, on, on the management of, of the disease, all of them are participating with us today to share with you their input, their experience on how to tackle one major health issue in this part of the world and also globally, that is diabetes. Uh, before really I start calling on our distinguished speakers today, I would like to share with you just very briefly, although you may have heard pieces of it already, very briefly some of the component of our research landscape in biomedical research. We already have so much of that established already on the ground, whether in education city or also in the rest of the country. In education city, we are fortunate to have one really world leading medical school, this is Wild Cornell Medical College, and we are fortunate to have with us today the Dean of Wild Cornell Medical College in Qatar, to really to ensure that the education, training, and research in biomedical science is done at the highest standard possible. We also have, within Education City, a science and technology park dedicated for more of applied research or research and development in a number of areas, including, of course, biomedical research through biotechnology uh, projects and programs. What we have also launched recently is the Qatar Biomedical Research Institute. That is, uh, that will be acting as an overarching structure to coordinate and integrate among all research entities within the biomedical science arena in this country. And this just has been launched recently. Outside of Education City, we have a number of really elite institutions that have been performing and successfully implementing research programs, including our national university, Qatar University. We also have a very successful uh, uh, research center dedicated to, gen um, to genomic or genetics or medical genetics, that is Shafallah Genetics Center, um, as well as, of course, our major clinical provider today here in the country, that is Hamad Medical Corporation. As you can see, the landscape, there are a number of really important elements and pillars there, and we, are, we will keep enhancing it until truly we reach the world-class and world-leading research or biomedical research in Qatar. So what I just said is that today, of course, we cannot talk about everything, but in the next 80 to 90 minutes, we will focus primarily on diabetes, a major health challenge, not only in Qatar, but in the whole region, and obviously globally as well. The distinguished speakers today will talk about, will take us through the whole continuum of diabetes research, from basic sciences, translational, clinical research, clinical services, as well as disease management. And for that, we'll get also the perspective from a global uh, uh, R&D company. Um, now we will start calling on the speakers to present uh, their, uh, or share with us their perspective on this, um, on how they tackle diabetes. And then after that, at the end of the presentations, I will call all the, all the speakers to the, to the podium here, and hopefully we can have enough time for question and answer with the member of the audience. It's not going to be in the order in which you have in the program in front of you, but we are going to start with our distinguished speaker from um, uh, Wild Cornell Medical College in New York, who will share with us um, really, really an interesting uh, approach to diabetes. And that's Dr. Francesco Rubino, who is the chief of gastrointestinal metabolic surgery, and he's also an associate professor of surgery at Wild Cornell Medical College in New York. Dr. Rubino. We're going to have to tell me how that starts. Thank you very much for, for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, be uh, presenting at the um, 
Qatar Foundation Annual Forum, and especially seeing uh, the fantastic program that you have uh, put together. So it's really a, an honor to be part of, uh, of this event. So I'd like to um, uh, suggest during the course of my presentation uh, uh, that perhaps in diabetes, going from bench to bedside might not be enough at a time where diabetes is growing epidemically, but particularly because of a number of um, um, reasons and um, difficulties that we find today uh, when we try to uh, um, search for the cure of a disease that has been around for many, many years. The reason why I say that is because uh, in reality, the scientific method that has um, inspired biomedical research, not only in the, in the last decades, but through the history of medicine, really uh, is more complex than just bench to bedside. It starts with a, a observation, with phenomenology, with uh, clinical um, observations, generating an idea. And from this idea, uh, you derive an hypothesis, and it's the hypothesis that is being tested in, uh, in the laboratories or in an experimental uh, fashion, so that you can uh, derive the uh, uh, advancing knowledge that is necessary to implement novel um, uh, therapies or novel clinical uh, applications. So uh, it is important to have verification of hypothesis, but uh, it is important that you have a, a vision of what uh, the uh, um, uh, science or the uh, aims of what of your research has to be. And I suggest that in the 20th century, maybe there has been, uh, in medical, biomedical research, there's been much attention, rightly, to uh, experimental, um, to the experimental part of the uh, scientific uh, uh, process, but maybe too much on the bench and too little on bedside, and perhaps nothing at all on the side of uh, idea generation, speculation. Why do they say that? In fact, I think uh, if you look at diabetes, at the idea that we have of diabetes today, what happens is you might probably realize that uh, we try to solve a, uh, a problem uh, without having a real uh, clue of what diabetes is all about. So we try to put uh, pieces of the puzzles, individual pieces of experiments together but uh, we don't know exactly how the final picture will look like. So it's so, almost like solving a puzzle, but not having the, the picture that you want to um, put together. I think it's important to, uh, to have that picture. It's important that we go back to the, uh, if you will, the uh, good old days where medicine uh, did include some forms of uh, vision, speculation, ideas in, uh, in, in, the pro in the scientific process. It might look si some, somewhat superficial, but I do believe it's very, uh, it is very important. And in fact, if you do that, if you accept that process, you have to start asking fundamental questions that I don't think we have uh, solved. In the 20th century, we've done a lot of research, again, um, at the level of uh, cell biology, molecular biology, but I don't think we have really asked, uh, answered fundamental questions. For instance, if I asked who is obese or what is obesity, I don't think we have a, a better answer than just saying uh, it's an excess of the body weight. And I don't think the excess of body weight really tells you the whole story because, in fact, when you look at the um, association between excess weight and metabolic disease and really a disease state, it really doesn't um, uh, show that there is a clear uh, cause-effect relationship. As a matter of fact, there are patients who are very heavy if you measure their body weight, but yet uh, quite healthy. And on the other hand, there are patients who may be uh, very heavy yet, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, very uh, actually lean uh, and, not, uh, and, and being very sick. So uh, if you look at this data, then you might have to ask the question, is obesity ill-defined the way we define it today, just only based on, uh, on body weight? And if you start uh, questioning that, then you may start questioning if diabetes is ill-defined too. Because as a matter of fact, we are only diagnosing diabetes as a uh, state of hyperglycemia, but we don't make an attempt to go a little bit deeper and uh, understand if what is the root cause, what is uh, behind the hyperglycemia. For instance, one could postulate, could speculate, what if excess weight and hyperglycemia are symptoms uh, and not disease per se? And so this is a very uh, fundamental question that I think we have not answered in the uh, uh, 20th century. So, uh, as a matter of fact, not having a clear picture of the disease and not having an idea of how um, 
we want to uh, look at these conditions may uh, have several implications, and I will not touch on all of them, but one in particular is the fact that we do uh, have a number of observations made uh, many years before that didn't fit with the uh, idea we had of, uh, of the conventional paradigm of diabetes, and they were completely dismissed. Uh, this is also it's a problem that is compounded by the fact that scientists today don't speak with clinicians, and clinicians don't speak with scientists. So, not surprisingly, situations like this, uh, uh, observations that diabetes could be actually cured, in this case, by a surgical operation performed to treat peptic ulcer, were completely overlooked, and for 50 years and more, nobody paid attention to this possibility. And I think this is, again, another limitation of 20th century medicine because of the fact that we uh, have um, not uh, continued to work together, uh, scientists and clinicians, and those clinical, clinical observations have unfortunately been um, uh, less, um, give, given less importance than it were uh, in the past. So conventional bariatric procedures, weight loss surgeries today are several type of procedures that are extremely effective in inducing uh, weight loss. And there is no question that this is the, the, by far the most effective weight loss intervention that we have. Uh, in addition to that, uh, that bariatric surgery improves uh, a number of uh, metabolic conditions associated with uh, obesity, particularly type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, um, hypertension, sleep apnea, and etc. But what is most important is that unlike other intervention in obesity and even in diabetes, uh, what surgery affords is an increased uh, survival in these patients, a reduction of mortality related to diabetes. Now, mortality related to diabetes is a very difficult um, issue because many medications that are still very effective in controlling hyperglycemia yet don't have necessary an impact on mortality. So the fact that there is a, an intervention, forget it, a surgery uh, that can reduce mortality from diabetes is a very, very important uh, uh, finding. It's a very important point to keep in mind. So how did uh, the idea of diabetes surgery um, come about? Uh, in fact, when I was a resident of, uh, in, and I was studying uh, minimal invasive surgery in 1999, I was uh, first confronted with this uh, phenomenal um, phenomenology of bariatric surgery and, and its effects on diabetes. And I came with this uh, very naive um, um, idea of uh, using surgery to treat diabetes. And you can imagine that in 1999, uh, this was really uh, a very controversial uh, suggestion if not heretical altogether. And in fact, it was uh, welcomed with quite a lot of skepticism uh, uh, over the years. But let me tell you why um, the, uh, the, the idea looked uh, uh, plausible, not only to me, but of course to other colleagues. And uh, to, to, make you, to give you an example, I think the best evidence comes from a, a, a one of the cases that the, we clinicians see almost on a daily basis when we perform bariatric surgery. This is a patient we operated in New York, but it's a very uh, paradigm patient uh, who has type 2 diabetes. Uh, in this case, not very severe obesity, BMI was 32, uh, for diabetic for several years, and on many medications, oral medications, 100 and plus units of insulin, and uh, uh, yet very poorly controlled diabetes. Now, should this patient have gastric bypass surgery? You can see how uh, looking at 24 hours glucose monitoring uh, where in red uh, is the time that the patient uh, spent in a very, with very high levels of blood sugars through the day, uh, and in green, the uh, good glycemia. Two, just before surgery, in spite of 100 units of uh, insulin and many other medications, this patient had a very poorly controlled glycemia. Then she had an operation, and in two weeks' time, her 24 hours glucose monitoring for seven consecutive days showed complete control of blood sugar levels. Over the course of a couple of weeks, she dropped uh, her insulin. She dropped other medications by month one postoperatively. She was off all medications for diabetes, for hypertension, and she also uh, intentionally stopped herself her uh, anti uh, and her statins, although we recommended not to do so. But anyway, in spite of that, uh, her A1C dropped into a normal 
level. So you can see levels of 5 point something, 5.4, 5.8 maintained uh, throughout the time. This patient came last week for the two years follow-up uh, and she's still normal glycemic as in spite of having no medication. So here is a concept. Uh, an intervention, a single intervention at one time point was able to stop uh, the, the cis progr uh, progression and actually reverse it. Uh, as lo as, at least as far as we uh, know, diabetes di uh, is no longer detectable. Uh, there is no more hyperglycemia, and there is no need for continuous treatment. So this is a very important observation because it tells you that there, it might be too much to be explained by uh, weight loss alone, uh, regardless, of course, of the fact that the effect is so rapid. So in fact, for many years, the observation I just mentioned has been around. Uh, no, forget about the reports in uh, the 50s, 1950s with gastric surgery for ulcers, but even with, gastric, with bariatric surgery becoming more popular in the 70s and 80s, these observations became, becoming even more uh, frequent, still it did not really uh, trigger the uh, interest of the scientific community, mostly because it was an effect that was justified by uh, weight loss. The idea was you know, we know that uh, obesity is associated with diabetes. Uh, to some people, this means also a cause-effect relationship. And any time you lose weight, you improve your diabetes. So not surprisingly, if you do bariatric surgery, you improve diabetes. However, the question was, what if that is not a good explanation? What if instead, uh, what in the intervention does, in this case surgery, but other interventions that improve diabetes, like exercise and dieting, uh, were there to improve uh, a metabolic uh, mechanism that in a result uh, causes weight loss and improvement of diabetes, uh, not necessarily as a cause effect between one another, but as two consequences of the same um, beneficial metabolic process. In that case, you would uh, postulate that uh, the effect of surgery in di on diabetes would be weight independent. Uh, and in fact, this is rational, is a rational thinking, in my opinion, because of the role of the gut as an endocrine organ uh, that is a key player in, blood, uh, in um, uh, glucose homeostasis. So we put together these pieces of um, um, concepts uh, and uh, we postulated that uh, the effect of surgery on diabetes might not be necessarily related to the weight loss, but perhaps to uh, some direct effect that surgery induces uh, in the light of the uh, role of the gastrointestinal tract. So with some experiments in non-obese mo uh, rat models, we, uh, using a sort of uh, modified gastro bypass surgery, we did uh, um, investigate the uh, uh, hypothesis and we found that the resolution of diabetes is a direct effect of surgery itself uh, and not necessarily uh, weight uh, uh, related, weight loss related. And it's also not a, unique to obese individuals. So these findings have been also duplicated by other labs uh, using rodent models, but also in humans where uh, uh, if you make uh, elegant experiments where you match patients by weight loss, one group from uh, surgical intervention, one group from uh, dieting and exercise or medical interventions, when you achieve the same amount of weight loss, uh, the difference in diabetes control, and particularly glucose tolerance, uh, is very striking with uh, surgery, in this case gastro bypass, improving glucose homeostasis much more than equivalent weight loss from other interventions. So again, suggesting that the weight loss, uh, uh, the, the effect on diabetes is weight independent. There are even other experiments in humans where patients who had gastro bypass who have a, a exclusion of the stomach and duodenum were submitted to an operation called gastro, um, gastrostomy where you basically uh, are able to re-inject nutrients in the otherwise excluded stomach and therefore providing an experimental model where one day you can stimulate the gut through the mouth and so bypass the duodenum and the next day you stimulate the gut through an, uh, in, a lot of glucose in the gastrostomy tube and then bringing back the uh, stimulus through the natural uh, intestinal route. Well, by just doing that in one day between one day and the next one, some researchers were basically able to switch diabetes on and off. 
uh, if you allow this uh, uh, stretch, if you will. But in a, in a sense, you see that the glucose tolerance is much better when the uh, glucose load does not transit through the uh, uh, conventional uh, gastrointestinal anatomy, and when instead is given orally in gastro bypass. And insulin production is much greater also when the uh, nutrients uh, actually don't do not transit through the uh, foregut. Uh, Levels. So, based on uh, those preliminary uh, research findings, we and some other clinical uh, observations com corroborating this idea that surgery itself may improve diabetes, we called a, a consensus conference in 2007 in Rome, the consensus conference called Diabetes Surgery Summit, uh, which was the very first meeting where we suggested that uh, surgery might be a treatment for diabetes per se not only in the severely obese ones. Uh, so the, the meeting did uh, have the merit of uh, introducing new, uh, not only the, uh, this idea in the scientific community, but also to introduce the concept of diabetes surgery and the concept of metabolic surgery. As a matter of fact, uh, while Cornell in New York, we, in 2007, we opened the, uh, perhaps what is the first academic uh, metabolic surgery section. And for metabolic surgery, we meant a uh, program where surgery is not uh, intended as a uh, conventionally bariatric surgery is intended as a, in other words, a weight loss intervention alone, but more like an intervention that is aimed at improving metabolic conditions, including excess weight, but not exclusively uh, focused on excess weight. Uh, by 2008, in September 2008, we organized the first World Congress on interventional therapies for type 2 diabetes, again trying to promote this idea and uh, uh, raise awareness in the scientific community. And a writer from the New York Times, who also is a book writer, uh, was in attendance to that meeting. He captured the uh, skepticism of the scientific and the medical community, particularly the physicians, uh, and uh, plastically reproduced that in a chapter that where he actually uh, titled uh, the, uh, uh, the showdown, surgeons versus endocrinologists, to suggest how this uh, issue uh, of uh, innovation sometimes is uh, uh, is taken with skepticism in medicine in general, particularly in, uh, in diabetes. By the time of uh, March 2011, last March, in New York, we organized the Second World Congress, and I have to, be, uh, to say publicly, I was very, very proud that the Qatar Foundation was a, a partner in this um, um, initiative, because it, uh, with the Qatar Foundation, and of course uh, with other uh, partners, we have been able to uh, run this uh, Congress, a Congress that I believe has uh, signed a landmark moment in uh, the evolution of this new dis emerging discipline. As a matter of fact, during the uh, Congress, the International Diabetes Federation, the world organization that puts together over 200 national diabetes societies, has made a, pus a, a public announcement of its new position statement that basically for the first time in history recognizes that bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery, if you will, is a diabetes treatment by all means and should be considered in the algorithm of diabetes management. In other words, it's uh, like telling, uh, if you allow this uh, little cartoon to stretch the, uh, the, the concept, it's like telling uh, physicians that uh, going forward you cannot uh, overlook that surgery as a role in diabetes management. This is a revolutionary uh, uh, thinking clinically. But most important uh, than anything else, in my opinion, even if I'm a surgeon, is not just the application of surgery to more patients with diabetes. Because in fact, we will never be able to operate all the millions of patients who have diabetes. Surgery is never and will never be for everybody. But what we can learn from surgery may change the way we look at diabetes forever. In fact, learning their mechanism, the mechanism of surgery is important because it can lead to better understanding of the disease and potentially new treatments. In fact, there are many potential mechanisms of action of surgery, and we'll not go in details over them, but you have to, uh, of course, imagine that if the, uh, this, the gut is an endocrine organ, as it is, that responds to food passage with the secretion of hormones that are very relevant for glucose homeostasis, insulin secretion, insulin sensitivity. Now, changing the anatomy of that organ might definitely have profound impact on blood sugar regulations. There are also neural uh, gastrointestinal mechanisms that are important and relevant to in the control of appetite, satiety, body weight, and again, uh, glucose homeostasis. And recently, there is some evidence that uh, even the, the gut microbiota, the uh, bacteria in the, in the gut, 
play a role in uh, insulin resistant states. And so we know that surgery does change um, um, the gut uh, microbiota environment, and that might lead to uh, potential uh, effects on uh, insulin sensitivity. Now, you understand that there are many mechanisms, but we are not uh, yet uh, at a time where we can tell exactly what is the uh, exact mechanism of kind of surgery. But this is important. Uh, this research is important because, as a matter of fact, by using gastrointestinal targets, we could be able to um, devise new procedures, including endoluminal procedures that might not uh, need uh, the surgical um, bypass of uh, pieces of the, the intestine, but could be, uh, if you will, uh, sort of done endoluminally by using devices that could achieve the same type of uh, functional results and potential clinical results. As a matter of fact, after we started the idea of putting a tubing into the duodenum as a, a experimental tool to investigate mechanism of action, there's been um, there has been there have been several attempts to um, use that concept in humans. As a matter of fact, there is a device now, and other not just this one, but many other devices that could be utilized to uh, provide a minimal invasive approach that mimics the action of surgery and could be available for more patients that surgery could be. But finally, let me go back to the um, uh, original. Uh, suggesting that uh, the scientific method uh, does require looking at the big picture and not only at molecular and bedside uh, issues. So the surgery really provides that opportunity because um, surgery per se is not something we can do with the microscope. We do it with the um, working on organs. So here is the speculation that we see when we have a, pro uh, um, uh, a, a treatment that really almost cures a, a, a disease, causes such a profound impact. Now you have to start asking the question of whether or not surgery is actually fixing what is broken, uh, because that is a possibility. And in fact, uh, you could come with the speculation, this is not uh, a science yet, but it's a speculation, it's the first level of the scientific method, where you can hypothesize, why not, that the, the gut may play a role in diabetes. As a matter of fact, the conventional paradigm does not include the gut in the um, uh, pathophysiology of diabetes, uh, whereas other organs have been considered. But definitely, there is some evidence that the gut could uh, uh, be a player. And I will, with just the last few slides, uh, try to uh, explain this uh, hypothesis. We know very well, for instance, that the physiologically, uh, no matter how much glucose you give orally, the glycemic excursions remain constant. So you can give more sugars and yet the uh, body is able to metabolize them properly so that you don't develop hyperglycemia. What happens is that uh, it has been seen that if you compare the same amount of glucose given intravenously versus given orally, the difference between intravenous and oral is that when you give glucose oral, orally, uh, there is more insulin being produced, an effect called incretin effect. And this is what scientists have uh, believed it keeps glucose excursions into uh, provide, prevents glucose excretion from going too high. My question is, with four times increase in insulin, uh, which exceed uh, what you would expect from an increase of maybe only uh, one-third uh, glucose uh, in stimulus, you would expect hypoglycemia to occur. Uh, and in fact, this never happens. Uh, otherwise, uh, every time we have a meal, we might become brain dead because the brain does not tolerate hypoglycemia. So I suggest that the system must have in place a very strong and powerful mechanism to prevent postprandial hypoglycemia. So when we eat, we know for instance already that incretins increase insulin secretion, insulin action, and beta cell growth. But all those three actions may lead to acute and chronic hypoglycemia, especially postprandially. So the idea is that there must be a, a control mechanism, which we call the anti-incretin uh, mechanism. And this is a theory that every time insulin, incretin from the gut stimulates insulin secretion and sensitivity, put in, in place a counter-regulatory uh, mechanism that balances that action and maintains glucose excursions within normal limits. So type 2 diabetes may be seen as an excess, as an imbalance, if you will, between these two physiologic mechanisms, one that uh, promotes uh, hypoglycemia in, and one that promotes hyperglycemia. And surgery may just the bulk uh, that excess uh, when this is present, and as a matter of fact, uh, by doing that, uh, causing uh, diabetes remission. So in other words, diabetes could be seen as a disease of the bowel, and in fact, 
it is known that every that uh, it is a disease like obesity associated with overeating. So overeating or maybe modern food may contribute to the pathophysiology of diabetes by triggering intestinal dysfunctions. Uh, and in fact, if you accept that hypothesis, you would es explain not only why overeating or modern diet can, ex can induce diabetes obesity, but also why every restriction to food intake might uh, improve these conditions. And in fact, the, uh, with a gradient effect from dieting to restrictive surgery all the way to gastro bypass surgery, where you basically put a piece of the bowel away from nutrient stimuli. And finally, I would say that uh, just back to the very first uh, um, uh, slide of uh, trying to have a, a, a look at the big picture and using the, the conventional classic scientific method in medicine where you have to try and put together not only molecular science uh, and cell, uh, cell biology, etc., which are fundamental to uh, discovering the cause of disease, but you have to integrate data with uh, observations from clinical um, 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 situations. With uh, epidemiology of disease, there is no way that a disease like uh, obesity and diabetes could be caused by a uh, complex interaction of uh, multiple genetic uh, issues and then uh, assume that this model could become epidemic in less than a generation. It must have, uh, um, the model must include some sort of envir environmental uh, uh, in influence and the, the gut is very well placed anatomically and physiologically to capture that environmental uh, change and determine a systemic disease. And finally, uh, focusing on an organ of the body uh, in the search for the cause or the cure of the disease is very important and it's been already important in diabetes history. In fact, it was thanks to the uh, discovery, uh, the, not even the discovery, the observation made by, by Minkowski in 1889 that the pancreas, removal of the pancreas from the body causes diabetes. It was thanks to that observation, again, that the hypothesis was generated that the pancreas is linked to diabetes so that other researchers could focus on the pancreas and, um, and this led to the discovery of insulin. by far the most important discovery in the history of diabetes so far. So finally, I think uh, the medicine of 21st century should go a little bit beyond bench to bedside and go uh, uh, and assume a model that starts again from bedside observation, hypothesis generation and speculation, which uh, today are not very well uh, regarded in the scientific uh, um, field. Try to make a hypothesis paper and, and hope that it's published in a major journal you can almost forget about it. Uh, so it, this has to be, come back into our scientific thinking, uh, in, uh, along with, uh, of course, experiments and molecular uh, experiments, so that we can go back to the clinical application of that. So the model would be from that side to bench and back to that side. I think this might be a better model for the future. And surgery does provide a, an excellent solution to that model, because with a clinical observation, there is a, uh, probably the most uh, profound uh, effect in diabetes ever seen. We can generate hypotheses, we can test the new hypothesis at, bench, at the bench side and uh, come back with new ideas for not only uh, new surgeries or devices, but even uh, new drugs in the future. So they may do what surgery does with less invasiveness. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Robino, for uh, really this very enlightening uh, presentation about uh, such an important clinical observation. Uh, can you imagine if the science really is pushed be beyond and understanding really what is the mechanism uh, that can mimic the effect of this bariatric surgery and hopefully develop really therapy that can replace the, the surgery itself? Um, I don't know how long you can stay with us, Dr. Robino, but we still have about 50 minutes before we, we finish our presentations and then we can have question and answer. I hope you can stay with us. Sure. Thank you. Um, now, let me turn to, I'm not going to follow the order of the, of the presentations here, but as we, as we go ahead. Uh, now, let me turn to our co distinguished colleague from Hamad Medical Corporation, Dr. Mahmoud Ziri, who is senior consultant and head of endocrinology department. And we'd like to, to ask you to uh, maybe reflect on what Hamad Medical Corporation, in particular in their department, how are you addressing the diabetes in particular? Would, would you like to come to the podium? Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, as we speak now, this is today is the 22nd of November. Uh, a week ago, like 14th November, is the World Diabetes Day. And uh, in celebration of this World Diabetes Day, which is really uh, like an awareness campaign about diabetes, the International Diabetes Federation released uh, the uh, Diabetes Atlas. And I just want to share with you some of the figures worldwide about diabetes. In the, uh, a week ago, they said, uh, like in the 2011, there is around 360 million diabetics worldwide. And uh, by the year 2030, if nothing is done, this number is really going to be about more than 550 million. And uh, here in the uh, Gulf area and the Middle East, they mentioned the top 10 countries. Six of these top uh, 10 countries in prevalence of diabetes is really five in the Gulf and another Arab uh, country. So six of all these uh, top 10 countries are really in the Middle East. Now, in the Gulf country, the prevalence of diabetes is around uh, 20, 15 to 20 percent, whereas if you look in the Western country, is roughly between 5 to 10 percent at most. Uh, why we are really uh, interested uh, in diabetes? Not because of really this hyperglycemia, so on and so forth. Diabetes really is the disease that affects all the vital organs in the, in the body, like the eye, the kidney, the heart, the blood vessels, the nerves, and uh, it is the leading cause of blindness, the leading cause of uh, kidney failure. It is chair an important cause in cardiovascular disease. And it is said it's like about 11% of the health expenditure goes to diabetes and its complications. Uh, what, what we have here in Hamad, uh, like medical-wise, we have all the facilities really are available to treat diabetes. Uh, regarding the complications that I just mentioned, we look at a group of our patients, about 400 patients, and we found that out of these 400 patients attending our outpatient clinics, there is like 37% of them got diabetic retinopathy. That's the, the eye is affected. And another 27%, uh, the kidney is affected. They got diabetic nephropathy. Uh, about 18 of them, 18% they got cardiovascular disease, and about 10% they have their uh, feet affected uh, by diabetes. Now, uh, man management-wise, we try to really uh, get a control. Now, controlling diabetes is not uh, just really a matter of blood sugar. Now, uh, previously, it was thought that really uh, diabetes is a syndrome. Whatever you do, the complication is going to happen. Fortunately, this was proven not to be the case. Uh, after the uh, publication in 1993 of the DCC trial, Diabetes Control and Complication Trial, which was run in type 1 diabetics, and the UK BDS study, United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study Group, they released this information. The UK BDS study was in type 2, and the DCC trial was in type 1. Those both of these, uh, those large trials, they proved that if we do a good job in managing diabetes, we can reduce the complication of uh, diabetes roughly around 60 to 70 percent or even more. So when we manage diabetes, we need efforts really to control the sugar, to control the other risk factors as well, like the blood pressure, smoking, weight, sedentary lifestyle, so forth and so on. Now, that's why we are looking to our colleagues in the basic science, that because we need more data to help us managing our diabetic patients. Like, not every body respond to medication the same. Dr. Robino just brought up an interesting issue about uh, gas bariatric surgery and gastric surgery helping to get blood sugar under better control using the incretin effect, GLP-1, uh, GLP-1 is really the hormone secreted by the gut, and they do improve insulin secretion, they do improve uh, satiety and they improve gastric emptying, and they take a control, uh, and uh, they take part in blood uh, sugar control. 
Diabetes is especially type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is like a syndrome. It is a heterogeneous group. They are not homogeneous. And probably within type 2 diabetes, there is subgroups. That's why we look forward to studies in genetic study, metabolomic study, to characterize phenotype and genotype of all these subsets of patients. The aim of this research coming to a clinical practice is really to get a better management and a better uh, life for our uh, diabetic patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ziri, for <clears throat> sharing with us um, your, your own perspective uh, on how to address uh, diabetes and uh, actually calling also for the importance of the management and the and addressing more and more the basic sciences behind diabetes. With that really I will call on my colleague from uh, Wild Cornell Medical College here in Qatar, Dr. Chris Striegel who is Professor of Pharmacology and Assistant Dean for Admission to share with us some of the efforts that he's doing to address the basic sciences or the basic research of diabetes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a great honor to be here. And what a fantastic convention center. I've spoken to many places around the world. I think this is, this is the, the very best convention center I've been in. It's very nice to, to, to talk about some of the work we're doing here at Wild Canal Medical College. And actually, it works very well to follow Dr. Ziri because he talked about two um, clinical trials, UKPDS and the DCTT with respect to type 2 and type 1 diabetes. And there comes my PowerPoint. And the importance of good glycemic control with respect to, to diabetes. Because the morbidity and mortality associated with diabetes, although we consider it to be an endocrine disorder, whether it's type 1 or type 2, really is associated with, with cardiovascular disease. And a lot of that is precipitated by vascular disease initially. So what we've been particularly interested, and actually I started off about 25 years ago collaborating with um, some cardiology colleagues who were uh, working, in, in interventional cardiologists who were looking at coronary angiography and, and uh, coronary artery disease, and particularly with respect to diabetic patients. And we were able to tame some tissues with the help of some of the surgeons from, from some of these patients who are undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting. So we, took, we started with uh, vascular tissues from humans, mainly internal mammaries and saphitous veins, and started looking at the properties of those vessels. The problem was trying to get control vessels from, from patients, i.e. patients who were not suffering from cardiovascular disease. So that led to our collaborations with respect to looking at animal models, notably mouse models of type 2 diabetes. And we've been particularly interested in the endothelium, and I'll talk mainly about endothelial dysfunction, which we consider to be a very early stage in the development of cardiovascular disease, whether it's precipitated by diabetes or not. And I'll start by um, actually focusing on this quote here. Let's just make sure I have the pointer. Um, okay. You're only as old as your endothelium. This is attributed to, to Rudolf Ostrow, who was the chair of the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy in the University of Saskatchewan and in Canada. And um, that was in a book he wrote in 1954. So even at that time, there was recognition that the endothelium really was a very important uh, uh, tissue with respect to the regulation of, of, of the cardiovascular system. So if you damage your endothelium, even if you're a young uh, person, you basically are aging yourself dramatically. And let's see how that works with respect to high glucose. Now, first of all, because often with these talks, one forgets to acknowledge the key people involved. So first of all, definitely want to thank the Qatar Foundation who have made this work possible here. Uh, many of my collaborators, I think, are here in the audience. Dr. Ding, uh, a couple of the postdocs here, uh, Arana Chalam, who's done a lot of the work I'll talk about, as well as Samson Sanyo and some very faithful uh, research uh, uh, people in, in the lab as well. And you'll see here uh, some very happy students who work with us uh, mainly over the summer breaks. So moving on, um, I have to say I don't have any financial interest in any of the work I'm presenting today. This is the endothelium, and as you can see here, 
the endothelium, the inner layer of cells of the vascular system here are very important with respect to maintaining cardiac health. As we get too much glucose, and those were glucose molecules coming in, then the health of the cardiovascular system collapses. And this is initiated by damaging the endothelial cell. The first work which really demonstrated endothelial dysfunction actually ultimately led to the Nobel Prize. It was given to three people in 1998. But Bob Fershkot um, in 1980, as indicated here in the paper in Nature, what he was able to show, and this seems like a very simple study, but it was in, uh, extremely important in terms of the impact of our knowledge of vascular disease and vascular uh, approaches to treatment of vascular disease, was in a normal vessel, and this is simply a rabid aorta, a conduit vessel, taken out of the animal and contracted with norepinephrine, we see it contracts. And then we added acetylcholine, or rather he added acetylcholine, and it relaxed, a very simple experiment. But that relaxation, which ultimately led to the observation that nitric oxide, a gaseous mediator of biological importance, was mediating that relaxation. If he simply rubbed, damaged the endothelium with a cotton swab, then you lost that response to acetylcholine. You got a contraction. And that's exactly what you see in people suffering from coronary artery disease, as was reported about ten years, uh, six years later uh, by Peter Gann's group at, at Tufts. What they showed, and let me just take you through the slide here, is this is the vessel diameter. So here you can see that the vessel diameter is decreasing, and that is in response to acetylcholine. This is in a coronary artery angiography study, and this is atherosclerotic coronary artery. So it's very much the same thing as Fershkot reported in his isolated vessel. Acetylcholine should normally cause a relaxation. It's a so-called endothelium-dependent vasodilator. Nitroglycerine, of course, used for a treatment of acute attacks of angina, does relax the vessel. You can see that the vessel diameter increases. Now, if you look at the vessel in a normal uh, in individual, no coronary artery disease, you see a relaxation to acetylcholine and to nitroglycerine. The significance of this is that in coronary artery disease, you have endothelial dysfunction, but the vessel will still relax to a vaso, uh, vascular smooth muscle, direct vasodilator, namely nitroglycerine. So this is an indicator of the importance, as I said, of the endothelium with respect to the regulation of vascular function here with respect to coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. Now this is a review article we've just completed and should soon, I think, be in press. It looks a little bit um, perhaps complex, but this is the blood vessel lumen here. And normally these endothelial cells are activated simply by blood flow across the endothelium and that re results in puffs of nitric oxide and perhaps other mediators being released. This is very important for maintaining blood flow. If you reduce blood flow, then the consequences, one of them indirectly, would be potentially insulin resistance development because you're reducing the ability of, of the skeletal muscle in terms of blood flow to take up the, the, the glucose via the insulin-sensitive glucose transporters. But also in the absence of nitric oxide, potentially you can get activated platelets and thrombotic conditions as well. So this endothelial cell layer, which you see in greater magnification here, provides uh, electrical continuity along the endothelial cell layer and to the vascular smooth muscle cells, uh, allowing the vessel to basically conduct blood flow in a, in a coordinated fashion. So here you see, uh, hypothetically, damage to these two endothelial cells here, that would disrupt blood flow, likely result in a thrombosis condition here. So as the other part of the slide indicates, this endothelial dysfunction, which we're describing here and described in the previous slides, is a very early indicator of cardiovascular disease, whether it's macro or microvascular disease. What I'll show you next is that even in a normal person, acute elevation of glucose will reduce blood flow by at least in a reversible manner, at least in a normal person, affecting endothelial function. So this morbidity and mortality we associate with type 1 type, B, type 2 diabetes can be directly really linked into uh, endothelial dysfunction, at least at the early stage, which will affect all of the organs throughout the body. So this is a study from a J Japanese group, and they used um, what's called forearm plasmography to study forearm blood flow, for occluding, like with a blood pressure cuff, around the upper part of the arm, and that allows you then, usually your um, uh, sophisticated Doppler techniques, but now it was sim used to be through simple water displacement, an assessment of, of blood flow in the brachial artery as a result of changes in flow-mediated vasodilatation. So again, you see that this is a reduction in blood flow as you go down here in arbitrary figures going from 8 to 2. 
And what they're doing here at fast, in, in fasting patients, they're giving them a 75 gram oral glucose load, which I think Dr. Rubino referred to in terms of assessing glucose tolerance. In a normal person, you see a reduction in blood flow at one hour, but it's recovered within two hours normally. A patient with impaired glucose tolerance, it goes down further and recovers, uh, and, and, and the recovery is not complete at two hours. But somebody with diabetes, frank type two diabetes, first of all, they start off with a lower level of blood flow and at two hours it hasn't recovered. So that's with an oral 75 gram oral glucose load. Actually, some Australian cardiology colleagues have shown the same thing with red ball. So some of these so-called um, spork strings, at least for an acute effect, I have a negative effect on blood flow. So this is a, some of the approaches that we've used going on to some of the mouse models. Disoxide is a KATP channel opener, which means it will hyperpolarize the cell. And in the beta cell, that results in a reduction of insulin release. So if you give an animal disoxide, and we give it by an intraperitoneal injection, you see that the glucose level goes up. Keep giving the disoxide, you can get glucose levels which would resemble like a type 1 diabetic mouse at around about 20 to 25 millimolar. And you can do that for several days. Here we stopped at four days. We take the vessels out of the animal. And if we recall from the earlier slides I presented, if we use a tissue from a control animal which has not received the disoxide, they relax quite nicely to acetylcholine. This is a resistance vessel, and this is the conduit aorta. They relax very nicely to acetylcholine, the endothelium vasodependent vasodilator but not in the vessels from the animal, which is exposed just for four days to that elevated glucose. So you can get that endothelial dysfunction, at least in this animal model, very rapidly. You know, we don't know yet it, whether the animal will recover in terms of vascular function after this. Another approach which we've used is to take a very small vessel, uh, either from a rat or a mouse, and these are vessels about one-tenth of a millimeter. These are resistance vessels, they're very small. You can barely see them, even, even with a, a microscope. You have to be very sophisticated technique to isolate them. Here, they're connected via two uh, glass cannulas and pressurized at normal physiological levels. And what we can do in that lumen there of the vessel is change the milieu. So we can start off with what would be normally glucose for the animal, about 10 millimolar for a mouse and about five to seven for a rat. Look at vascular function and then change the milieu in the lumen and assess what happens when we raise glucose. So I have a video which will hopefully show us this. So let's see what happens. So basically this, it's already started. Uh, this is the vessel and you can see that the lumen is getting bigger. It's dilating as we apply the endothelium dependent vasodilator acetylcholine. So this is the lumen here, it's being superfused. We now stop, we elevate the glucose to 25 millimolar, we give it one hour, just one hour in high glucose, and then we repeat that acetylcholine relaxation. What this experiment has showed us, that even in one hour, there's a reduction in the nitric oxide mediated and also non-nitric oxide mediated vasodilatation. So just a one hour exposure to elevated glucose does have this uh, negative effect on blood flow. Now it is reversible, but accumulatively, uh, this is another question. So the other approach we've used is animals which are already diabetic. I won't talk about all the animal models that I've used, but this is one, a leptin defe de receptor deficient. So these are leptin um, resistant animals. It's a single amino acid mutation in the long form of the leptin receptor. They develop, uh, depending on the strain, C57 black mice, they develop hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, and obesity very, very rapidly. And the males would die in about six to seven months of uh, cardiac diabetic my myopathy. Um, at about eight weeks, the glucose levels are beginning to rise. You can see, compared to a non-diabetic control, they are a lot bigger. They are quite obese. So let's look at some of the data from these animals. Again, using a very similar technique, we take resistance arteries. In this case, they're coming from the mesenteric arcade. They'll be about 100 microns, and we use what's called a wire myograph. Using the first cot technique, which I described in one of the earlier slides, we can contract these vessels, and then we can show that they relax. Um, in this case, it looks very normal to acetylcholine. So that has no vascular endothelial dysfunction. We take tissues from these animals at eight weeks of age, when they are just beginning to get diabetic, blood glucose levels are beginning to go up. Won't take you through all the data, but you can see that there's no difference when we compare a diabetic to a non-diabetic. In other words, 
these animals are not born with vascular disease. At this stage of eight weeks at least, they are quite normal in their behavior. At 12 to 16 weeks, you see a significant reduction in the ability of acetylcholine to relax. And I'm just putting around the circle on the tissues from the diabetic animals. This shows us that there is essentially no nitric oxide mediated vasodilatation at 12 to 16 weeks. So in that four week period, these have developed vas uh, considerable uh, endothelial dysfunction and, and vascular disease. There is some relaxation remaining and that's a very interesting area which we're following because even that, what mediates that from a physiological point of view is different from what you see in a normal animal. So this is an interesting change with respect to the pathophysiology of blood vessels in diabetes as well. The other approach that we use is to take cell cultures because you can do a lot of work with a cell culture technique a little bit more rapidly and then take it into the animal models to assess whether this is in, indeed an appropriate approach to use. So we've argument that we've used, as you saw from the early studies, that, that raising blood glucose will have a rapid effect on endothelial function. And a lot of the work which has been done, not, certainly not just ours, indicates this is most likely triggered by an increase in oxidative stress and our quest has been to look at those sources of oxidative stress. So these are some tissue, uh, cell culture tissues of mouse microvessel endothelial cells, and you can see uh, kind of a red color here. Uh, that's an indication, that red color of oxidative stress, and that's in low normal glucose. If we raise to high glucose, you can see that the fluorescent level goes up. This is at 72 hours exposure, which means that oxidative stress has gone up. If we use a blocker of one of the enzymes responsible for oxidative stress, apocyanin, you can see that the level is going down and that's in the histogram here. Interestingly, this compound here, sepiatrin, is important for, it's not a naturally occurring, but it leads in to the production of tetrahydroboptin, a long name, but tetrahydroboptin is a key cofactor for regulating endothelial nitric oxide synthase which I've already indicated to you does, in terms of nitric oxide production, does seem to be one of the targets which is being affected, at least by this acute hyperglycemia. So we've looked into this a little bit more carefully, and this is some, some work uh, recently published by Dr. Ding about a year or so ago from work here at Weill Cornell Medical College. And I'm just gonna show you this one Western blot and focus on that. What that shows you, and hopefully it's, it's clear, is that in low normal glucose you have more compared to the monomer of this dimer form of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. When you go to high glucose, there is a reduction in the ratio, even though it looks like you've got more, but there's a reduction in the ratio between the dimeric and the monomeric form. This can be reversed by providing the cell culture sepiatrin. What does that mean? What it means is that the dimeric form of the, te of the enos is responsible for producing nitric oxide. When you uncouple it in high glucose oxidative stress and get more of the monomeric form, that monomeric form does not generate nitric oxide, but rather generates uh, superoxide uh, through an NADPH oxidase-like process. We've gone on, our colleagues, Dr. Ding and the group here at Weill Cornell, have gone on and shown that basically a number of, uh, of changes are occurring in endothelial function. And to just to briefly summarize, they include a reduction in some of the antioxidant enzyme mechanisms, mainly superoxide dismutases, an increase in one of the um, uh, regulators in terms of oxidate, uh, NADPH oxidase, uh, this paradoxical increase in nitric oxide synthase, which you might think was good, but there is a decrease in the dimeric monomeric ratio. So in that respect, that's a bad change. And change in cyclooxidase two, which contributes to oxidative stress, and some changes also in calcium homeostasis of the cell, which lead to apoptosis. So this summarizes that aspect of the work and, and essentially uh, almost at the end of the presentation for today is that at least acute hyperglycemia, probably through a burst of oxidative stress from a variety of sources perhaps, results in an uncoupling of the endothelial nitric oxide synthase and that loss of, of nitric oxide generation and therefore a reduction in blood flow. So if, that is, if it's an exacerbation of that event in terms of a chronic exposure, that could lead to long-term changes in vascular function for diabetes. Is that something which is happening? So now we've gone on to look at some of the regulators of ENOS. And the focus, at least very briefly today, 
is on CERT1. CERT1 is very interesting because it's the mammalian homologue of CERT2, which came to fame because CERT2 was associated with calorie restriction and longevity in yeast. And similar work went up then with uh, the fruit fly Drosophila, as well as the nematode C. elegans. The argument being that CERT1 was a positive, re positive enforcer of longevity, negative aging. Some of that work has been disputed recently in an article in Nature, uh, but nonetheless, CERT1 is an important protein. What it is, it's a, it's a deacetylase. So as you can see here from some of the arrows, indirectly through this transcription factor, it's involved in histone regulation. So by deacetylating this transcription factor, in this case, it's reducing the influence of uh, that transcription factor in terms of the hepatic uh, uh, glucogenolysis, uh, glac uh, glucone gluconeogenesis. So it's reducing this in that way, it would reduce the amount of, uh, of glucose being produced. In the endothelial cell, via deacetylation, it improves ENOS function and also decreases the negative effect of NF kappa beta and uh, p53 in terms of apoptosis. So in terms of endothelial cell function, CERT1 is, a very, is thought to be a very important regulator. Interestingly enough, one of the key drugs which is first used uh, for most people suffering from type 2 diabetes, namely metformin, also probably has as one of its targets um, uh, CERT1. It probably has several targets, as does this interesting uh, polyphenol resveratrol probably best associated with the cardiovascular protective effects of red wine. These all seem to increase the expression um, and effects of CERT1. Um, and in my last but one slide, this is some recent work uh, done by one of our postdocs, Dr. Aaron Trillum, who showed similar results, interesting enough, with the extract from cigarette smoke also having a negative effect. So here we're looking at a Western blot with CERT1 expression in normal glucose with a vehicle for, and with the metformin. So that's the vehicle for metformin. Essentially no change in CERT1 expression. You go to high glucose in these same mouse uh, microvessel cells, endothelial cells, you can see that in high glucose alone, there's a reduction in the expression of the CERT1, um, but that is restored when you provide metformin. So this would seem to support some of the uh, postulations I made from the previous slide with respect to CERT1. So this is an interesting target, uh, of course, um, being pursued by many labs with respect to a potential protective effect in cardiovascular disease and, in fact, in, for metabolic disease in general. And it may be an important part of what's called hyperglycemic memory. And by that, I mean that in situations where there has been an elevation of blood glucose for a period of time and then normal glycemia is restored by appropriate therapy, uh, that there is still a memory of that effect of the, high, of the high glucose in terms of vascular disease. So is these change, are these changes in CERT1, possibly through uh, a regulation of DA, res, DNA, responsible for some of these longer term effects in terms of diabetes, which makes diabetes, I think Dr. Ziri might want to comment later, a difficult disease to treat with respect to long-term consequences of, 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 uh, of, of the morbidity and mortality associated with cardiovascular disease. So in conclusion, acute effects of raising blood glucose in normal people as well would seem to be a, a rapid effect to reduce blood flow by basically reducing the, the production of nitric oxide. Longer term effects result in these changes in uh, antioxidant and prooxidant enzymes and possibly linked into also changes in CERT1, which might be part of the longer term consequences of, uh, of, in a, of in, in a, in, inefficiently uh, therapeutically uh, controlled diabetes. So just to end back with the slide I used early on, I'd like to thank all the people who've done the work. I wouldn't be actually up here if it wasn't for the people who did the work. So uh, I thank all of those and a number of international collaborations that we have. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Trigel, for uh, sharing with us some of the insights about your uh, you know, the outcome of some of your approach in basic research and understanding, better understanding the physiology or physiopathology of diabetes. Um, I, I have to admit, I completely agree also with our previous distinguished speaker when he mentioned also the management of diabetes is an extremely important 
uh, aspect in, in truly addressing diabetes. And we are fortunate enough to have with us today uh, Dr. Philip Moroga, who is the Market Access Senior Director in the inter Intercontinental Region from Sanofi. And he will share with us also maybe some opportunities and challenges on how to address the disease management in this special case of diabetes. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. So I will go through a few slides about disease management and what we know about disease management programs. Um, now we are working in this field with what we call the chronic care model, which is very important because we try to look at the whole, the comprehensive view on the uh, disease, and we have to consider community health system and the interaction between these two, these components, resources, policies, self-management. And the patient has to be considered as a part of the system and interacting with the system. So if you have productive interaction and if you have a proactive patient, you may have improved outcomes. One of the big issues in chronic disease, and not, and specifically in diabetes, but not only in diabetes, is that the patient should be active in his disease. If you give him only drugs without any support, you won't uh, move from efficacy to efficiency. The diabetes care team has been uh, clearly designed, uh, developed and, 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 and described in many, many papers from, for, for example, by the International, International Diabetes Federation uh, booklets, booklets. And we know that now uh, we should have an uh, interactive team. And uh, around the patient, which is uh, at the center of this, uh, of this uh, program, you will have uh, um, doctors, you will have nurses, you will have uh, health educators, you will have the family, we will have, you will have the midwife in some uh, for uh, in certain, certain circumstances, neurologists, and so. And in the 90s, the pharma industry tried to develop disease management program, but what they have done is they included services in the product, and they didn't really try to develop disease management program, which were comprehensive and including all the different actors, and it failed. So now there is, a, let's say, uh, definition of disease management, which is agreed by all of the players in the system. So disease management is a system of coordinated healthcare intervention and communications for population with conditions in which patient self-care efforts are significant. So you have to work with the patient, you have to support the physician, you have to support the practitioner, and you have to look at primary prevention and secondary prevention and at, at the end of the program, you should evaluate and you should con uh, consistently evaluate uh, the results of different uh, performance indicator, uh, economic, um, medical, clinical, uh, human uh, indicators. Um, in these definitions, we consider that the disease management uh, components are six, uh, and any program should go through uh, the, 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 uh, through all these six, six steps and use these tools. So you are first to really well identify your population. Then you should use evidence-based practice guidelines. Um, physician and support service provider should be included in the program. Patient self-management education is very, very important from primary prevention to secondary prevention. Process and outcomes measurement, evaluation, and management are key. And a routine report, a report and feedback is very important because you need to exchange with the GP, with the specialist, with the patient about the way the, way the patient is dealing with his uh, disease on a daily basis. When you use not all the six tools, the six uh, pillars, then you can de design different programs, but they are not now considered as being disease management uh, programs. So uh, there's a very uh, interesting paper about taxonomy for disease management, and you see that uh, it's quite well defined that if you look at patient population, you will be very interested by the comor comorbidities associated with the disease and the non-clinical characteristic of the patient. 
then you have to define who will be the recipient of the action. It would be the patient, but it could be the physician. And it should be the physician associated with the patient. Then the intervention uh, can be uh, can can use different formats, from uh, medication management to peer support, remote monitoring. You can have, uh, you can uh, have different kind of interventions. You uh, may use I mean you may work with nurses, physicians, pharmacists, social workers. All those uh, professionals can be included in a disease management program depending on the situation of the country. Then the method of communication. Uh, in the US, you will see a lot of web-based, webinar, this kind of tools. In uh, the Middle East, face-to-face -face and group session are very important, and we learned that in Dubai because we started to develop a program with uh, some partners. So it's a, it's a balance. Uh, you have to balance the different uh, tools you will use and the method of communications. Then intensity and complexity are very important. There is a question of duration if you want to start to prevent complications. The environment, because usually you are going to the uh, um, primary, primary care um, units, but you can do that in uh, hospital settings or at home. And at, uh, at the end of the process, you should measure uh, the results. So patient population, um, non-clinical characteristics are very important. And we have seen that in Dubai, because you have a very heterogeneous population. So you have to adapt your program to education level, annual income, um, and uh, my status. You have to look at the comorbidities. You have to clearly define uh, if the patient, uh, the risk of the patient uh, adjusting for complication. Intervention, as I, I told, uh, told before, um, is to benefit to patients, but indirectly, when you start to talk and to educate GPs, you will have uh, an effect which is uh, measurable on patients. And by definition, any disease management program we, will alter the organization of care. So you have to be very careful to be sure that the, the professionals will accept this program. Usually, what you try to do is um, to educate patients on the main, um, 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 main point of the disease, so weight, calorie, intake control, blood glucose, which is done by uh, uh, doctors usually, but then you have to explain to them behavioral strategies, how they will deal with, they will deal with diet, and how they will behave on a daily basis. And uh, group settings are very efficient to help patients to exchange about the daily life. It's by definition a very multi multidisciplinary approach to care. And uh, nurses are the key cornerstone of such programs, but specialist physicians are very important because they will have a synerg synerg synergistic effect with the nurses. So, uh, there are also models where you use health educators or, or models where you can have nurses, health educators, and physicians at different time uh, of the program. You will see that in many countries, and in Dubai we will do uh, the same, you use call centers, SMS, and any means to remind and help the patient to try to be adherent and compliant. But in, 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 in Middle East and many countries, in India and other countries, um, that won't be uh, enough. Uh, maybe in the States, it demonstrated a certain efficiency, but in Europe, for example, we, we rely, uh, rely a lot of face-to-face uh, -face intervention. So intensity and complexity. The problem of complexity is that if you start to do everything you can do, as described in the literature, you are facing an issue of cost. So you have to balance, depending on the situation, the intensity of the actions the different actions, and therefore the complexity of the program. As I told uh, at the beginning, usually you are going to primary care clinics. Uh, in Dubai, for example, we are in an uh, outpatient uh, care uh, center. So depending on the situation in the country, you will uh, design uh, your program in different uh, settings. And uh, there is no clear, I mean, there is no uh, rule uh, which prevail. 
when you, st you start to want to evaluate um, your program, you need to have some health outcomes, but they will be linked to the processes of care. So you need to state in your program what will be your different uh, tasting, A1C, AP testing, retinal examination, that will be included in the program, that's part of the program. You have to remind the patient to do it. You have to help him to be compliant with the treatment, but compliant with the follow-up uh, he has to, to do. And then you can start to measure uh, health outcomes. So blood pressure control, glycemic control, LDLC, all the classical health outcomes. And that's part of the program because that's key to demonstrate the efficiency of your program. Um, in some uh, papers, uh, it has been clearly uh, demonstrated and it's meta-analysis that you can have um, a novel uh, decrease in A1C but you have to be humble. 0 0.5 is uh, feasible. When you start to see this management program with minus one, between uh, uh, an improvement of minus of one point um, in the group with intervention, it starts to be very difficult to achieve. So 0 0.5 is considered as being a, a, a correct target. What is very important is that uh, um, the number of actions, interaction with the patient will be key and it's very clear in most of these papers that uh, the intensity will be directly linked with the efficiency in uh, decreasing A1C. In terms of cost, um, you can see in green that uh, uh, the first uh, bar chart that uh, annual inpatient hospital days decrease when uh, patients were um, adherent to, to a program, so they didn't uh, go to hospital uh, so much, it didn't really uh, impact emergency, and it did impact, but positively impact, to the sense that it was more costly in terms of uh, media GP visit, by definition, because the patient will have a follow-up which is more intense than without a program. But if you look at the, you try to balance the different costs, it's positive for the program at the end. In terms of uh, cost saving, we have different vision looking at the literature. You can see that four uh, programs, four studies uh, were cost saving and with an honest um, diminution in terms of cost, and two were not cost-saving. For the two which were not cost-saving, uh, we can consider that the incremental cost of the program in terms of actions, in terms of uh, visit of physician, in terms of uh, drugs, were uh, too important compared with uh, what was measured as uh, outcomes. So the, the, the costs were, uh, were not there. However, you have to remember that to really have savings in any disease management program, you have to wait. And usually, you have to wait around two years to start to see saving on the first complication for the patient uh, under the, in the program. So a one-year evaluation won't be very fair with such a program. You have to evaluate after 18 months to two years to see uh, any cost-saving effect. In the German program, and in Germany, uh, the program was um, a national program. So GPs are central to the program. They are administrating the program, if you want. It's not nurses. And they are following the patient. And we can see that there were, there were clear clinical um, outcomes in terms of uh, mortality and uh, diabetic complication. And there were clear uh, co cost cuts uh, for the patient uh, following the program. So we do think that uh, disease management, when you have all the actors around the table working together, uh, could be an answer to the needs of the patient with chronic disease in their daily life. Uh, it's uh, beyond the bed. It's during uh, the whole life of the patient when the patient uh, is in his daily and working life. And he needs some support. But you need to support, at the same time, the physician you need to strengthen the relationship between the physician and the patient. You need to emphasize prevention because very often um, patients will try to less consider uh, all the prevention they can do, secondary prevention. So if you will design a program, which means you balance intensity and complexity, you have all the actors uh, in the program, you could achieve 
uh, you could help the patient and achieve efficiency and have uh, quite clear outcomes at the end of the process after at least a minimum of two years. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Moroga, for sharing with us some insights about the disease management, and I hope that we can have a chance to, for, to, to elaborate further on that during the Q&A session. Um, at this time of the day, all the sudden, energy and attention start to fade away. We need truly a dynamic and uh, very active speaker for that. We left really Ms. Uh, Nabi Hakazi to, uh, to close the session for us. Uh, with her presentation on policy. Uh, she's the managing director of Humanitas Global Development, and she will share with us also some of her input through her extensive international experience in, in this field. Please come. No pressure <laughs> at all. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullahi, for hosting us and, and uh, for inviting me to, to join uh, this panel. Uh, my organization is based in Washington, D.C., and a significant portion of the work that uh, we have underway is in, in the global health space, working with international organizations, NGOs, and, uh, and foundations. And uh, I was actually quite excited to be part of this panel because it's taking research and, and scientific insights and integrating them into policy and good effective programming that's at the heart of, of really what we do and, and our guiding philosophy is really making bench to bedside uh, not only attainable and successful, but sustainable in the long term. So my talk today uh, is uh, an opportunity to showcase a, a really groundbreaking initiative uh, that integrates uh, science and research into policy and programming, but that's also informed by community needs. Uh, so it's not science and research in a silo, but it's really looking at science and research based on what's going on uh, in the community. And, and more specifically, um, looking at a model in the nutrition science space. We've had the great fortune to work very closely with uh, Ellis Rubenstein and his staff at the New York Academy of Sciences. And uh, together we designed and the Academy has launched a, a really unprecedented uh, nutrition science research initiative um, called the Sackler Institute for Nutrition Science. And uh, this initiative, uh, and what I hope to show by, by, by showcasing this program, is the role of multi-sectoral leaders in not only uh, informing uh, science uh, priorities, but also uh, application and policy and programming, and uh, looking at how uh, you design a diabetes research agenda within the local context, within a regional context, and certainly within a global context. So I'm looking broadly at uh, global health challenges and considering the billions that have been spent uh, on tackling them, we've actually learned quite a bit. Uh, and the question is to, that, that I think we need to ask, especially those of us in the diabetes chronic disease space, is what actually makes health initiatives stick? And so I show this, uh, this diagram, and there's central elements here uh, to consider. It's actually exciting to look at them within the context of what Her Highness and what the Cutter Foundation wants to achieve because a lot of these elements are actually in effect right now. So, uh, you know, the first one is top-notch science and research. And this actually forms the, forms the foundation of an evidence-based approach to not only setting your research agenda, but also in designing policy and programs. The importance of having excellent delivery products and services that are accessible to communities in need, to communities that will benefit from your work. Having multi-sectoral engagement and integration, and you know, this word multi-sectoral, cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary is, you know, thrown a lot in, in the global health space, is thrown around a lot in diabetes. And for us, it's more than just simply having diverse voices at the table, but figuring out what is the value add of these different players across sectors. What can they bring to the table? How can you engage them so they can support implementation and not do it in a silo, but certainly are supporting an integrated strategy uh, that we'll talk about um, that Qatar has an opportunity to develop. 
The political support is critical, which you have. Uh, timely m and &E, there have been quite a few discussions around that, so I don't need to elaborate, and I know you value that already. Uh, empowered beneficiaries, and, and who are the beneficiaries, I guess, also needs to identif be identified. Uh, what do we want them to take away uh, from our work, and who are they, and, and do we bring them in from the get-go to then create demand and create appreciation for the outputs of research, for the outputs of policy, and for the outputs of programming? And unconventional voices. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to highlight uh, the work in the nutrition space and lessons that can be learned. And at so many meetings and conferences, I always look around the table and say, what voices are missing? And, and I always say, with much love to the nutrition community, with all due respect, uh, we need to stop talking to each other and, and bring in the unconventional players to the table from the beginning of any programming. Because these unconventional voices are so powerful in influencing behavior change and shifting the perspective on what the policy should be and, and also really pushing us on, on thinking uh, what, what comprises really good, relevant science and research initiatives. And we have to remember that, you know, our work is ultimately about the beneficiary. And the work in diabetes is going to be about launching a movement to change habits, to change behavior, to change beliefs. And this transition to bedside really requires this enabling environment with some of the elements that I've just highlighted. Uh, we need to ensure that those who benefit from research, who benefit from policy, who benefit from programs, aren't merely recipients of information. Um, that we account for those who are at risk and those who, who are trusted as catalysts to change health indicators and ultimately are going to affect how we shift diabetes rates um, in Qatar, the region, and internationally. So we know the rates of, uh, of disease, we know the rates of diabetes, we know the burden uh, that they are on health systems, on countries, on the economy, productivity, quality of life, etc. cetera. Uh, Non-communicable diseases actually took uh, center stage and, and are high on the global radar screen uh, with a global call to action. This past September in New York, the United Nations uh, hosted a, a General Assembly special session on non-communicable diseases. It was uh, the second such session ever held on a health issue. The first one was on HIV AIDS about a decade ago. And I think this, uh, this quote from Secretary General Ban Ki-moon sums up the global call to action, but also the country call to action quite well. Uh, he said that the summit is the chance to broker an international commitment that puts non-communicable diseases high on the development agenda, which is where they belong. So there's clearly uh, an emergency. There's an emergency uh, here in Qatar. There's an emergency in the region. And uh, looking at the emergency, it's also a tremendous leadership opportunity uh, for all of you in this space here and in the region, and that Qatar can build a country and region-specific response in a very integrated and informed manner and not do it in a silo, dysfunctional, disconnected way. So. If we look at what's elevated diabetes and NCDs uh, to the limelight, and, and there is a link to what we've learned in nutrition, um, clearly there's more data, more information on mortality rates as they link to diabetes and NCDs. It's on the radar of global health authorities, as I've highlighted. Also, we know of more effective interventions and lessons learned that can be adapted to other programs, so we don't have to replicate work, we don't have to duplicate work and spin our wheels. We know the economic consequences. We know of the productivity losses. Um, I, I failed to mention the cost-benefit analysis of, of early intervention, preventative efforts versus late-stage interventions. And there's a whole host of new cross-sectoral initiatives that are coming to the forefront. Actions that the private sector is taking, action that academic research institutions are taking, policymakers, et cetera. And there are important parallels to nutrition in all of this. Uh, there are important learnings, like NCDs, uh, nutrition was overlooked in the development agenda. Nutrition lacked funding. Uh, nutrition lacked a home. Uh, there was a, a lot of debate, discussion on what exactly makes for a good nutrition initiative. What should the science around nutrition be? Who's going to own it and who's going to drive it? And I think those are all learnings uh, for Qatar and, and, and for all of us in this space to look at this in the correct light, learn from perhaps the mistakes and opportunities in the, in the nutrition space, and drive a dialogue and a response to diabetes, um, and make sure that you're multidisciplinary, multisectoral, that you're not only addressing your country needs, but also regional needs, and that those needs influence and inform your science agenda and policy. 
So if we look at the Sackler Institute for Nutrition Science, this is a model that we can learn from. And uh, as I mentioned, it's housed at the New York Academy of Sciences. It's an innovative public-private partnership, something actually that's quite unprecedented in the nutrition science space. It's science-centric. It focuses research endeavors on current and emerging needs. There was a very important question that was asked when, when, when this initiative was developed by the Academy. It was where can the Academy add value to nutrition and tackling malnutrition, whether it's obesity, um, overnutrition, undernutrition issues, micronutrient deficiency, etc. So as not to duplicate efforts. And I think that's a very, very important lesson is that you don't want to do that. You want to ask the question, how can we be unique and how can we add to the body of knowledge? And so it, thus emerged the Sackler Institute. And it really accounts for and engages cross-sectoral leaders for implementation and for advocacy around nutrition science research. What are the priorities and how do they align with, with uh, current needs globally, but also emerging needs? And uh, as I mentioned, it is a global initiative. It's unprecedented, and, and the outputs ultimately support major international goals, but also will be useful for in-country institutions, research institutions, donors, uh, practitioners, policymakers. There are two overarching co components of the Sackler Institute. Uh, the first uh, broad, is, broad component is collaboration with the World Health Organization and other leading uh, authorities in this space. And the mandate is to formulate a prioritized nutrition science research agenda. And there, there are three elements to this. The first one is evaluating and leveraging the evidence base around given nutrition topics identifying what the gaps in knowledge are, and number three is mobilize around those gaps in knowledge. So bring the private sector, bring uh, government, bring academic institutions, bring researchers, bring funders, et cetera, to look at what the body of evidence shows, what the gaps are, and how do we tackle that. The next overarching component is activation of leaders and institutions to implement this agenda. So it's not an agenda for an agenda's sake. Uh, it's actually a working piece um, that guides future work uh, and, and that's really going to provide uh, direction to uh, those in different sectors. So developing this cross-sectoral call to action and also constructing really innovative science-centric nutrition projects and initiatives that inform policy and interventions. And as I mentioned, you know, the institution uh, or the institute is not about promoting research for research's sake. This is really a, a platform to catapult uh, new innovations, new conversations, new dialogue, and most importantly, focus this work on real-world application of research priorities. So how does this work? The Sackler Institute, the first component, as I mentioned, was for formation, formulation of a, a research agenda. So the first element is actually a broad research, identifying those broad research focus areas. From there, uh, talking about what are the very specific research questions and issues within each focus area. Then evaluate that evidence base. Find out what we know, what we don't know, where the gaps are, and communicate not only what the evidence base shows, but also how we should be filling the gap. Now, typically, as many of you know, research agenda setting uh, ends at uh, the communicate the findings. And uh, personally, I think what's most exciting in, in evaluating this approach in this model is it takes it to the next level, which is actually implementing those calls to action and figuring out how do we actually apply what's on this agenda in the field. So there's, a ro there's robust work around development of calls to action by sector, very specific roadmaps, and again, not, by, not, by, not in a siloed manner, but figuring out what is your value add and how can you contribute to delivering what we say we will deliver as part of this robust uh, scientific agenda. Seeking endorsements and support to push the word out further and create this culture of, of advocates uh, to have a unified front. Then, of course, the implementation of this work and monitoring it and figuring out what kind of impact are we having. And finally, it's driving action around emerging issues and driving action and dialogue around issues in the nutrition space that may be overshadowed or overlooked for X, Y, Z reason. We have the opportunity to be tremendously creative and tremendously innovative and really push the envelope here. So this model applies uh, very well to the diabetes space in Qatar. 
uh, you all have the opportunity to formulate a prioritized diabetes science and research agenda and focus that agenda and the research strategy on immediate needs but also on emerging needs. I'd also urge you to partner, partner with credible third party groups and world class leaders to elevate and expand your work um, because I, th I think there's going to be tremendous value in whatever you find in Qatar in the diabetes space and whatever is important in the region. The onus is on those who are here doing this work to communicate to the global community, this is what we found with our populations, and this is what's important to us, and this is our response, versus the other way around, where you have a handful of insights, I shouldn't say a handful, insights from other countries and other regions of the world that should be applied here, but quite frankly, may not be relevant. Um, also, engagement with diverse stakeholders, so your policies and your programs engage and empower vulnerable communities. Uh, and, and how do you engage and empower them? Well, go to avenues where they're living, where they're working, where they're playing. This is, you know, potentially complex stuff in terms of implementation, so you don't want to add on an, another action step. If you can infuse your policy uh, outcomes and infuse your programming into areas where your vulnerable communities already are at, you're already 10 steps ahead. And as I mentioned, unconventional voices should be at the table, so not on the receiving end. So we should have representatives from media. We should have youth. We know that uh, children have a huge influence over what their parents are doing or what their grandparents are doing. Um, we, we need to have leaders from the faith community at the table, celebrities. So who can bring a diverse perspective and bring them on board at the beginning to construct informed policies, informed research, and informed programs? And as I mentioned, do research that furthers the global dialogue but also addresses your needs. So I hope you see that the stars are aligned for Qatar in terms of being very deliberate, evidence-based, cohesive, and comprehensive in your response to diabetes. Science, policy, and programs cannot function in a silo. And in fact, if they do, we're wasting resources and, and, and we're losing momentum and we're not making the kind of change that we need to make in communities. And this is ultimately why we're here. This is ultimately why we do science. This is ultimately why we shape policy and why we implement programs is making this a better place and, and giving our children and our loved ones and future generations a, a healthier life and a healthy future. So, you know, those who are on the bedside I would ensure that you be utterly unapologetic in building the bridge between science and policy and programming. And those who are on the bedside of things, you need to be just as vocal and ensure that science and research endeavors are relevant to population needs and are going to make a difference in communities and the lives of people who are affected by diabetes and who are threatened by it in the future. Thanks. Well, now I understand why Dr. Rubinstein is saying that I will recommend to you one of the best people we have. Um, so um, now we're almost at the end of our session today. Uh, we still have a few minutes for Q&A session, but before we start that, I would like to invite the, our distinguished speakers to come to the podium, join me here. And also I would like to check if Dr. Robino is still with us. Yes, I am. Oh, great. I think you would all agree with me that it was truly a, a fantastic session where we had a, a comprehensive coverage about what, uh, what opportunities we have and uh, how are we addressing it in, and in Qatar through different institutions, whether from the basic um, or translational or clinical research. We have also heard from our distinguished speakers from New York, who are still very patient with us all the way from there and also tackling other important really and relevant issues there, whether it's the management, the disease management, or the policy development. Now I would like to hear if the audience would like to ask some questions. And let, let's start with my colleague here. Is there any other? And if you can please uh, state your name, institution, sure. and uh, uh, My name is Javed Sheikh, and I'm the Dean for Weill Cornell Medical College in Qatar. Um, Dr. Howdy. I congratulate you for really 
bringing together such a stellar group of speakers on a very important, timely topic, particularly for Qadr. And I enjoyed the uh, presentations very much. My question is for Dr. Nabiha Qazi. And uh, the question is that, have you had experience in translating this model to different countries and different cultures, and I'm sure you do, and particularly for Qatar. And the reason I ask is that, uh, for example, in Qatar, we have, as you said, at the highest level, the political will, the resources, the scientific finding, findings are available, of course, to practitioners here. However, as yet, we do not have an effective primary care system, which would be a major uh, I would say, a factor in, 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 in this particular issue in terms of management of diabetes. Uh, probably involvement of the family, for example, here more so than in Western cultures, that would be very important. Could you comment on uh, any of this in a broad fashion? Thank you. You know what, can, is this on? Um, it, it's a very good question. And I'll tell you that I think components of this, and I know components of this, have been implemented, um, for example, in the HIV space, where they were looking at comprehensive treatment models. And, and by the way, I spent a large portion of my public health life in, in HIV. Uh, if you look at this in other chronic diseases. Uh, but it seems to always be done in a very siloed way. And uh, I, as of a couple of years ago especially, there's been this movement to talk about the comprehensive nature of how we tackle uh, challenges in the health space and beyond. And you know, that's why this is so exciting, and it was so exciting to, to, to be able to form this with the New York Academy of Sciences, is that the approach and the model was very innovative. For example, international organizations cannot work, WHO, et cetera, cannot work side by side with the private sector. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's just one example of some of the barriers. In other cases, there's, there are donors who are very uh, focused on where and what their money goes to. So, you know, we had a clean slate in, in how to create something and look at all the pieces that work very well in terms of interventions. And what the Academy does extraordinarily well is taking science and figuring out how do you translate this into application. So, it, it, from what I know, this is the first time that such an initiative, such a comprehensive initiative, is actually being implemented with science at the center in the nutrition space, um, which is why the WHO came to the forefront. It's also why I think it's such a critical opportunity for Qatar to show, ha, huh, we're going to learn from all these different pieces in different sectors and maybe even in the diabetes space in other countries and create our own model and our own formula for getting this right. This question. Uh, I'm Mohamed Boujdir from uh, NYU School of Medicine, New York. Uh, I'd like to say that as a cardiovascular person, I, I really enjoyed the uh, presentations as uh, diabetes uh, was mentioned is interlinked with, uh, with cardiovascular diseases. Uh, my, I have actually three questions for uh, uh, Dr. Rubino, Dr. Trigel, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Moroga. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to list them and then we'll go through the uh, answers. <clears throat> uh, for Dr. Rubino, uh, I think you showed a case report with a two-year follow-up for glucose and A1C monitoring. Uh, I was just curious to know whether there are any long-term follow-up studies for bariatric metabolic surgery that is data uh, or relapse. How, how, uh, how, what do we know on that? Uh, for Dr. Trigel, uh, you did mention that calcium homeostasis directly affects vascular relaxation, and you briefly mentioned an increase in uh, TRPC channels. I was just wondering if you can comment on changes in another important channel, uh, that is calcium channels, and how they are affected in uh, the diabetic model that you discussed. Uh, also, in the, uh, what, what is the cardiac phenotype for that leptin uh, uh, deficient mice? Uh, for Dr. Moroga, I, I, I actually, it's more, than a, more a comment than, than a question. Uh, you gave a very nice uh, forest view of the management of diabetes, and I am delighted to hear that uh, outcomes research, uh, for example, 
targeting behavioral changes uh, uh, that is minimizing the risk factors first, then adherence, compliance to medication uh, is, is a critical and, and uh, uh, important factor to consider in this uh, complex intervention processes. Thank you. Dr. Rubino, would like to, to start? Yes, thank you very much for the question. In fact, I use that as, a, as an example um, because it's one of the patients we recently operated as part of a, a clinical trial to address the use of surgery in low BMI patients. But as you pointed out, there is experience with bariatric surgery for many, many years. And the, probably the best study that looked at the long-term uh, effects of surgery is the Swedish obesity subject study, where there are patients who now have a follow-up of over 20 years from uh, the initial bariatric surgery. And they have seen that uh, remission of diabetes, if you don't want to call it cure, but remission of diabetes persists at least in 60% of their patients over 20 years. Now, 20 years of a complete remission of diabetes, uh, in some cases, might be defined a, a clinical uh, cure, uh, if you will. And in fact, the American Diabetes Association, for the first time, because of diabetes of surgery, has uh, raised the question of whether diabetes can be cured, not only managed, so that we hope the, the, this is a, it's not surgery for everybody, but surgery might st start giving us the, uh, uh, raising the challenge and, say, and the bar and say, can we go f beyond management to curing diabetes? It sounds like for few patients uh, who had surgery many, many years ago, this has been possible. Thank you. Um, and I think there was a, another question to Dr. Trigel also. Thank you very much for your question. Can you hear me? Uh, good. So, so the calcium channels involved are, are those which are involved in the so-called store-operated calcium entry process. Uh, our original work, uh, Dr. Ding's work, actually uh, indicated it was uh, uh, upregulation of TRIP-C1, which is a, an associated channel. Consequent work we've done links it in to RE1 and STIM1. So they're involved, uh, and in our case, you see an elevated calcium level in the endothelial cell, which we haven't directly linked, but in other, uh, other stories coming from a group in, in England, Leeds, namely David Beach, that's been linked into vascular uh, neointimal disease. So it's uh, elevated calcium linked into caspase activation apoptosis. So some of the work we're doing in collaboration actually on, the, on liver hepatocytes um, and steatosis uh, collaboration with a group in Adelaide, Greg uh, Barrett, but it indicates some uh, additional changes occurring, probably in the same mechanisms as well. So this might be some universal changes occurring in calcium homeostasis uh, in diabetes, not just in the vasculature, but perhaps in other systems, and obviously important with respect to liver function. And the other question, I think, was the cardiac phenotype with respect to the DVD leptin uh, resistant mouse. Um, it's not our work, but that um, it, it develops cardiomyopathy quite rapidly, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, the work that we've done in collaboration with a group in Calgary indicates that even though you can bring down the glucose levels with appropriate drug therapy, reduce weight uh, by exercise uh, and also diet, uh, you cannot uh, delay the onset of this cardiomyopathy. So you can improve other aspects, but unfortunately this particular animal model uh, particularly the male, does die at a, an early age. Thank you. Um, this question here. Thank you very much. It's a uh, very interesting presentations. And, uh, oh, of course, sorry. My name is Latifa El Hadri, and I work with United States Pharmacopoeia, but I am uh, working closely for uh, developing countries for malaria, HIV, and TB. Uh, in pharmacovigilance and also quality control of medicine, as well as raising awareness and uh, helping community to deal with this, uh, with these diseases. So uh, uh, it is like uh, I don't know comments or questions uh, regarding the management of this disease. So what we see here, of course, when you have educated people, so they can understand the danger of the consequences of diabetes versus when you have people that are not educated, so the message doesn't go through. When you say, uh, this is dangerous, you have to go through diet, you have to manage your this and that, but they don't get it because, as you mentioned, it is a silent. So I believe it is very important when you talk about all these type of managements, 
of course, uh, talking about the diets or people that they can go through surgery, but not everybody can do that. So to have a mass response, I think it's very important to raise awareness. Without raising awareness, without having leaders, you mentioned religious leaders, leaders in the community and so forth, those are the people that they can convey the message on the issues and on how to address them. And it would be good, like this type of panel, to have some people that are involved in uh, IAC activities, information, education, communication, in order to change behavior. Because it's very difficult to change behavior, even though you're saying, okay, you need to enhance your diet, but lifestyle and so forth, there is a need to do a good uh, communication on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any member of the panel would like to, to comment or reflect on this? Yes. Yeah, please go. Dr. Ziri. Uh, I completely agree with you that we need to raise awareness among the public and among the patients. And uh, the World Diabetes Day, which I just alluded in uh, initially, that the 14th of November, is really to make more awareness and awareness about diabetes. And here, uh, as our colleague mentioned in Dubai, they have the team. In, Hamad, in, in Qatar, in general, Hamad Medical Corporation, we really have the team working since 1997. We have the physician, we have the educator, the dietitian, the podiatrist, and we did measure the outcome. We look at the team uh, management effect on pregnant ladies, and in that <laughs> sense, we really, the complication for the mother and for the fetus has been reduced by like, almost like 50% of the time. So I can't agree anymore with you that really, education and awareness and knowledge is what is matter because a patient visit the doctor for a few minutes in the clinic but at, at the end he is living alone with his diabetes so living with diabetes is an essentially the patient he knows how to live friendly with his case the other is really prevention awareness is very important for prevention and the theme for the diabetes now is act now on diabetes and in Qatar we took the diabetes prevention and as you mentioned, lifestyle changes is an essential. Lifestyle change for prevention of diabetes can work in like 58% of the case. And it is an easy measure. Just have a healthy diet, exercise, keep your weight what it should be. Thank you. Dr. Moroga, would you like to add something? Yeah, only one comment. Uh, we need leaders, but when you talk with patients, they need to talk together. So we need to maintain their, their will to, to, to treat themselves. They need to talk with other patients. So we need awareness, we need leaders, but we need to help the patient to find places where they can talk together. So they need to talk with their peers. So I do agree with your comment, but they will put on top that uh, patients need to have this kind of space to talk together. And it's very key in chronic diseases, not only in diabetes. The thing I was going to add is, yes, of course, awareness is important, but we also have to think about what shape that awareness comes in because it, it, it goes beyond simply putting up a message on a billboard or handing out posters. It has to be a very personal, emotional thing. And, you know, we are talking about while the lifestyle changes are easy to, to say, in reality, you know, are, are we willing to give up our dessert? You know, and, and we're in a room of highly educated people, but uh, it, it, that's a challenge. Um, so it has to be very, very personal. Um, and it has to be positive and hopeful, not something that's, you know, scolding or scary to them. Yeah. Intervention is, a, is certainly extremely important. And I like to just stress that intervention at a very early age. It was mentioned that, uh, you know, children can influence their parents, but we are seeing an increase in obesity and particularly type 2 diabetes, and type, for that matter, but type 2 diabetes in young, young children. If we can start at a very early age, influencing some children in terms of lifestyle changes, appropriate diet and exercise, then I think that would be a, a very important step as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, one question. Hi. Sherud uh, Jindi. I'm the program manager for Qatar Diabetes Association. I'm also a career diabetes educator and the question is for Dr. Rubino. When we do bariatric surgery, uh, we are lowering blood sugar levels. We are making diabetes better. Are we creating a healthier person? Are there any problems with absorption, with all this other stuff? Because bariatric surgery for a diabetes educator 
is the easy way out. And, and we need to come out and say, if there are other problems with it, that will emphasize what everybody else is talking about, let's live a healthier lifestyle versus let's just go to the doctor and have surgery done. What's your opinion on that? I appreciate the question because uh, it, it allows me to explain uh, more the, uh, what I was trying to say before that, again, is not uh, the idea that you should use surgery as a frontline treatment for diabetes for the vast majority of patients. I don't think that would be uh, feasible uh, and not, maybe not even logical. You have to think about surgery as an option, uh, as you do it for many other diseases that are like cancer or inflammatory bowel diseases where medical treatments are not sufficient to ensure a good quality of life and particularly a reducing the risk of dying. Now, some of the patients with diabetes actually have a very high risk of dying soon, when they, especially when they have hyperlipidemia, this, uh, hypertension, and other cardiovascular risk factors. What happens with surgery is not just that we improve glycemia, which per se would be beneficial. But what happened with surgery is that we improve uh, uh, lipid uh, control, we improve uh, hypertension control, and, and so on. But, and the bottom line is an increase in survival that has not been shown with any other intervention uh, on, frank, uh, on, uh, on uh, fully developed diabetes. Having said that, obviously, surgery comes with risk. Uh, and potential side effects. So as usual, uh, with any other surgical treatment uh, for other disease, as for diabetes, you always have to wait uh, pros and cons. And obviously, a patient who has exhausted all the other options, who is not responding to medical treatment, and I would say there are many patients, unfortunately, who are kept on medications even uh, and in spite of uh, evidence of lack of efficacy. What should, when is the time? When is the time to give those patients the chance of having a next level intervention that has a potential for saving their lives. This is the question that I think, talking about uh, awareness and leadership, we need to uh, ask. And, and so the future will be not only uh, operating more patients, which I, again, I think uh, uh, it would be interesting for some part of the population with diabetes, but how can we do that in the safest possible way so that we minimize the complications uh, and we emphasize the uh, benefits and enhance the benefits uh, distribution to more people? Um, I think uh, your point in the end is right. There is a, uh, um, a time for lifestyle changes, a time for medication, and there is a time to escalate treatment uh, when uh, these other options do not work. Unfortunately, in diabetes, as you know, we don't have that type of model. We stop at li lifestyle and, and medications too often, and we neglect the possibility to escalate treatment according to disease severity and uh, um, responsiveness to treatments. There is no such a thing in diabetes, like in cancer, like risk stratification and uh, uh, you know planning therapies according to disease sta uh, stage or tailoring the approach to the single single patient need. We expect that uh, everybody will respond to uh, lifestyle and, and drugs. There are many patients who will, but many others who won't. And I think having another option is a good news for patients. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. There's one here. Uh, Kasiba from Wisconsin. I'm really scared from your idea that the bariatric surgery is the cure for type 2 diabetes. Can you really exclude or dissect whether the improvement in blood sugar is caused by this little stomach removed, little piece of stomach? Or it's the large amount of visceral fat usually jumped on by the surgeon as he goes to the stomach, plus the weight loss. The other thing is, the majority of people who have done bariatric surgery are extremely obese, very obese, and they're usually young. They're not old, so a lifelong study is impossible on them. To compare to the type 2 diabetes we see in our clinic, they're usually older, and they actually become diagnosed when they already have diabetes for 10, 15, or 20 years. And they come in with complication, as in Hamad uh, Hospital here. So I think this comparative issue between bariatric surgery could be a better option or a cure, I can't swallow it. The other thing is, 
I mean, most of those patients, after they have surgery, they're very miserable. You ask them. But don't show them you are the surgeon. Send them to a physician. They tell you they're depressed. They actually feel restrained, obligatory not to eat. It's different from when, when you motivate yourself to eat. That was one question. The other comment is for the calcium channel blockers. The glucose you used is very high. I mean, I saw your medium glucose, 25 millimolar. That's above 500 milligram percent. Nobody who's diabetic achieves this level unless the person is dehydrated. Usually, the blood sugar level in diabetics stop at 300, 310, which is a maximum tubular reabsorption. If it is greater than this, it's dehydrated. So this is a rare patient who just comes because he or she hasn't been taking treatment. And, and uh, I, I don't know how can we apply this to the real life diabetes. Yeah, maybe Dr. Rabido would like to comment on the first question. Yes. Well, I, I, I appreciate the question, and I, I, let me tell you that uh, it cannot be overstated how surgery is not uh, the panacea for every patient, uh, for diabetes. And I agree, I fully agree with that. Uh, there are potential risks that are always to be taken into consideration. However, having said that, uh, it is not uh, true that uh, patients who have bariatric surgery feel miserable. The patients who have complications obviously feel miserable, and we have to always uh, try to deliver safer surgery or maybe even minimize invasiveness, as I mentioned before, and find new solutions that are not surgical. But the beauty, if you really talk to the patient, to the majority of patients who have certain type of operations, particularly gastro bypass, it's exactly the opposite of what you mentioned as a, a lifestyle condition for surgery. Patients do not uh, feel constrained uh, because they cannot eat. They do it if they have a stricture or if they have a complication. The typical patients who has, say, gastro bypass will tell you that uh, it does not feel the huge to eat, and particularly, it does not feel the huge to eat high-fat food. Now, this is true for patients, but it's true even for rodents. There are studies from uh, uh, the Imperial College of London where they actually took uh, rats, rodents, and did a gastro bypass and put them in front of a choice of food with high fat or low fat. There are no people who are constraining them, and they are choosing the low fat food uh, more often than the high fat food. Nobody knows exactly why that happens. But if you really took the time and speak with patients who have gastro bypass, they will consistently tell you, doctor, I don't know what you have done, but I don't feel hungry anymore. And it's not because they cannot eat. Uh, with gastric bending, uh, which is a restrictive procedure, you would see people maybe complaining that they would like to eat and they can't. But this is not true for all procedures. So we need to really be very um, uh, inquisitive and ask what up? And again, it goes back to what I said before clinically, ask from a, uh, questions based on clinical observations. What we see in, in the clinic is not patients uh, willing to, to eat more and unable to do so because they have a small stomach. We see patients who consistently tell you, I have a decreased urge to eat fat, high fat food and bad kind of food. We, if we understand what is the mystery behind this change, we might deliver that without surgery, and I would agree with you that that would be the ideal form of treatment and not a surgical operation. Thank you. Dr. Yes, yeah, that's a good, good question on the glucose. But the key thing is we're using mice. The basal glucose level for a mouse is 11 millimolar. If you put them at 5.5, they're going to cardiac failure very quickly. They don't like being hypoglycemic. So the diabetic mice, the type 1, go up to 25 millimolar. The type 2 can get as high as 45 millimolar which is approximately 700 plus milligrams per deciliter. If we use human um, uh, uh, endothelial cells, the, uh, we, we work at much lower concentrations of glucose, of course. Your mice in the morning have a blood sugar of 11 millimolar because they eat during the night. They don't eat during, they the reverse of human. 
doesn't matter what time of day you take uh, the mice on average and we've done video recording of mice they eat approximately 30 times a day in the cage you have to be very careful in terms of comparing animal work to human work you have to use appropriate animal conditions for animal work as I said if you use 5.5 in a working heart preparation of a mouse the heart will go into failure very rapidly one last question yeah. just a, a brief comment to to say about this uh, argument uh, we have now reflect the complexity of the disease. Any diabetes meaning I know is always very uh, challenging like this. Uh, I'm very skeptical about the, the, the potential of uh, changing lifestyle. So uh, the, the result of uh, all nutritionists in the world tell you we are succeeding in having people losing weight in two or three percent of the cases. That's maybe the disease. And in our work, we show that probably diabetes have a muscular dystrophy that make they don't, they cannot exercise. So that's something we have to think about. I've been very interested by Mr. Borino's uh, 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 remark and, and work. I know there are discussions and challenges. But nevertheless, the results are what they are. When you make metabolic surgery, you see an improvement. You have to explain the how it is like this. Uh, I will ask you only two questions. Have you, do you have any non-responder to this surgery first? And have you been able to do this surgery in non-obese people? Thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I, um, I, we do have non-responders. Uh, in uh, in uh, bariatric surgery, there are patients who uh, have this extraordinary resolution of diabetes uh, within sometimes days or week. On the other uh, hand, there are some patients, uh, luckily uh, not as many, uh, but very few, that however do not respond uh, to surgery with a, uh, an improvement of diabetes. I think this is a very important uh, observation because if we understand who are the ones who not respond and why they don't respond, we might learn a lot about the disease. If you consider the discovery of insulin a hundred years ago, at the time there was no understanding that there were two forms of diabetes. They started to give insulin and when you have a treatment like insulin or now even like surgery, who is dramatically effective, seeing non-responders may be a hint that there are different forms of disease uh, out there. And I think this has to be uh, considered. The second question was about... Uh, 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 the result of the surgery on non -obese. Yes, in low, low BMI. Yes, there are uh, several studies around the world where um, uh, surgeons have started to utilize uh, operations to treat diabetes in low BMI patients. We are conducting a clinical randomized trial here in New York where we operate on patients whose BMI is between 26 and 35, and we compare um, gastric bypass versus optimal medical treatment for these patients. There are many other pilot studies already published in the literature showing that you can actually use gastric bypass for low BMI patients. These patients will not lose as much weight as the more obese ones, yet many of them, uh, not a trivial number, do achieve similar forms of remissions that we have seen in the morbidly obese population. So now the, 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 the challenge is how do we uh, ensure we uh, select patients properly for surgery regardless of their BMI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now it's time for us to uh, close this workshop. I would like to really express our warm thanks and gratitude to distinguished speakers, um, Dr. Robino from New York, Dr. Moroga, Dr. Trigel, Dr. Ziri, and Ms. Kazi. Please join me in thanking them for their speech. And I believe in about 40 or 45 minutes, we will start our uh, gala dinner reception. So I hope you'll all join us for that. Thank you.